Hi everybody, International Master David Proust here with this week's installment of Pro Chess Lessons. This one is brought to you by Fourth Boards, Silicon Computer Engine Monsters, and of course Chess.com for helping to, uh, you know, for running and sponsoring the whole Pro Chess League. Um, normally, my Pro Chess lessons, or frequently, my Pro Chess lessons come from board ones and. Often board ones matched up against board fours. They beat them down real hard, and we get a real clear lesson. But uh, today's lesson actually comes from a board four. However, I was so intrigued by this thing, I threw it into a computer engine online to check the lessons I thought I was learning, and as usual, discovered that what I think I knew is never quite the truth. There's always more to it. It got crazy and complicated, but uh, I'm going to try and keep it from getting out of hand for all of you and keep my variations in check. Um, that said, our topic today is the value of development versus material in the open games coming from double king pawns. In that sense, it could very well serve as a follow-up sort of special bonus video to my series on development on chess.com, um, a many-part series, which I highly recommend to anybody who wants to know more about the value of development in chess. So um, here we have bishop d3, which is an offbeat variation of the scotch game from white here. Normally in the scotch, if you trade on c6, you will follow up here for white with either e5 or knight to c3. But bishop d3 is a little bit unusual and probably not very good because the logical move for black is to counter white in the center with d5. And uh, that's also the best move. And then there's nothing particularly good for white here, as far as I can tell. Um, to me, the logical two moves for white in this position are to either trade off on d5, in which case there's no special advantage to having played bishop d3 over knight c3, but it could be playable, I suppose. Um, and the reason you play e takes d5 is because black's threatening to win your pawn on e4, and basically you want to get a tempo back by trading and making black spend a tempo on cd5. But then blacks equalize the center. So you haven't achieved much. The other move that could be logical would be e5 here, um, trying to get the tempo back by attacking the knight. But I believe that if black goes knight to g4, um, sort of attacking the pawn and threatening you know, bishop c5 and queen h4 type nonsense, you don't actually win a great tempo off of e5 hitting the knight because um, you're going to have to spend a tempo dealing with this knight's threats against h2, f2, and e5 anyway. And I think black's going to get pretty actively developed pieces in a good in a good game. So I think after I think there's not really any particular merit to this bishop d3 line. But um, the move white plays in the game is queen e2, and this is a good example of how you can start to slip into trouble with white in a position like this. It's just you know, one of these subtle things where moving the queen is just not quite as strong as moves like trading a pawn, castling, developing a knight. And so we're just going to see that here. Um, well, white sort of may threaten e5 or e takes d5 next. Um, so if you play bishop e7, then e5 will be a little bit better than, I guess, variations where I played bishop c5 for black, maybe. So black plays the logical move, which is just to take on e4. And now um, it seems to me that it's time for white to just play bishop takes e4. And um, then I got very excited when I saw this thinking like, let's punish white already because, you know, their bishop's sort of dangling in the center and they played queen e2. Now how much can you punish a move like queen e2? You're black and white's played one move which might be a little dubious on move seven. I mean, can black kill white? Probably not quite, but you'd be surprised how close it can be sometimes. How close you can sometimes get to punishing the opponent um, very, very early on in a game off of one small slip up when you've got two kings on, on the E file. So the idea that got me really excited for black was bishop b4 check with the idea to leave the bishop hanging after c3 or bishop d2 and just castle. And then basically I want to play rook e8 on whatever white does. So white may as well take my bishop on b4, rook e8. 
And now, you know, if white castles and lets me take back on e4 with the rook hitting the queen and bishop, I've got a small development lead for black. White's pieces get a little awkward. I can sort of annoy him a little bit or something. But I think it turns out that this variation doesn't quite pan out for black. And I'll show you one example of a variation that doesn't pan out for black before we get into a lot of variations today that do pan out for black. So without too much explanation, let's just play out a variation. Um, that will show, sorry, that will show white getting into an okay position out of all this. Um, here they can just castle, rook e4, queen d2, and get out just, just fine. Um, and another thing I wanted to show was the following variation. Um, after knight e4, if instead of bishop f5, I go bishop a6, hitting the queen, looking to get fancy, picking up both of these pieces. Queen e3, now I've prevented that simple castling variation from white and play f5. Then after rook d1 from white, queen h4 and rook d4 and white, covers things just fine, and uh, we'll chase black off, leave the bishop just not really attacking anything. So it turns out the best for black after bishop e4 is the boring, just taking on e4, playing queen e7, queen's trade, and you get this endgame with the bishop pair um, and the slightly worse pawn structure. If I had to pick which side I would play, I would pick black, and so I think this being the best that white could do kind of you know, cast its own doubt on queen e2 as a variation, but obviously is not a very severe punish just yet. But white tries to press their luck a little bit. I mean, the problem with that bishop e4 line is like the moves are so logical and easy for black. So if you played this bishop d3 variation, your plan is just to trade into this, this end game here. I mean, there's nothing for black that's tricky for them to find before they've got, you know, a very comfortable, if not better end game. So white's looking for something a little bit trickier with this variation. They play knight to d2, um, which I guess I would say is a little bit dubious compared to bishop takes e4. And now things start to get more interesting for black. Now we're starting to get into the range of maybe a punish. And um, Feliz Osmanoja of the Berlin Bears plays bishop b4, which is a strong move, already starting to put pressure on this. To thinking about maybe keeping the extra pawn on e4. Um, and things get tricky for white here. And they immediately make a further mistake. Bishop takes e4, which is that material move, right? Getting back, getting back the pawn, aiming at maybe this pawn. But um, it's going to lead to a bad position for white by force. So what should white do about bishop b4? Well, not c3, which is an obvious mistake after queen takes d3. And white will be down a pawn and down in development here, right? These pieces are going to come out a little bit slower than blacks. And white's never going to win back the pawn on e4 or d3 if they trade on d3. Um, so the only good move for white, surprise, surprise, is to sacrifice a pawn instead of trying to win a pawn and emphasize castling quickly. Um, in this position, white could play knight e4 with a fine game if black doesn't go for the pawn win with bishop takes d2. And then bishop takes d2, we castle. White cannot regain the pawn because the bishop's hanging on, on d2 here to the queen after we trade on e4. So um, the next thing for white would be to just move the bishop away and give up the pawn before black takes on d3. Now in this position, white is definitely down a pawn and they're not really aiming to regain the pawn on e4 either. But this dark squared bishop is super good because black's got no pawn on a dark square in the center to limit it. Um, and white's got the bishop here and the better pawn structure. So this could lead to an interesting game. You know, I can't evaluate it for you um, very precisely. Certainly black's got an extra pawn and the possibility of plunking the knight on d5 to try and cover some dark squares with the knight. Um, that's definitely going to be the plan for black at some point soon. But, you know, it leads to an interesting game. 
and uh, if you're going to play this bishop d3 nonsense, then maybe you might as well go for this. Now, after the move, bishop takes e4, white's going to be in bad shape. Black can simply castle, and now white can't castle anymore because of bishop d2 and knight takes e4, right? Winning, winning material like we, like we saw in that previous variation, right? Dangling piece. So here, after castles... Um, white's stuck between grabbing the pawn on c6 as the sort of preemptive way of dealing with rook e8, which loses, by the way, spoiler, or playing c3, which also looks quite bad for white, but maybe doesn't lose as hard as grabbing the pawn. So I'll show you just one sample variation to give you a feel for c3. Here, um, I'll just say that, you know, black could retreat bishop c5, allow castling, play rook e8. They're obviously, it's obviously going to be pretty good for black because they're going to get the bishop pair. They're going to have a small lead in development, um, but it's not overwhelming. And what I want to show you is just an absolutely sick idea, which I think gives black a very strong advantage, which is a5 saying, hey, I'm ready for bishop a6. If you want to do this stuff, I'm always going to win back my piece on this e-file or almost always, and I'm just going to have a great game for black now, so here, take it, bishop a6, queen moves, rook to e8, um, the idea is like knight e4, knight e4, f5, for example, um, f3, the way white's going to have to defend it is f3, defending the piece, and then when you take fe4, play f4 to try and keep the e-file closed, now I'm just going to try and win back the piece quickly for black with f5, White can't castle, and this variation that we've played for black by not trading on e4, we haven't let these pieces out yet. It's very slow and hard to get them going. So I, I just give one variation. I thought maybe king f2, getting off of the e file and preparing rook e1. Black takes on e4. We get the knight out and develop these pieces. Uh, queen h4. And here I'm going to show you a maneuver that I learned a couple weeks ago. The value of this from Daniel Naroditsky. Um, which is your queen h4 check, g3, queen h5. Now, the whole point of that queen h4 check, it didn't stop white from castling or anything really, but the whole point of it is you start attacking the h pawn, which makes it harder for them to coordinate this rook and bring it out. The queen also starts to like attack this light square, which be could become annoying for white. And uh, if you want to learn more about how to do that, check out this game here. Um, oh, sorry. Check out. This game here between Naroditsky and Smirnov, where Naroditsky spent a whole tempo going queen h4 check, g3, queen back to h5, just so white has to worry more about this h3 pawn. That's uh, Smirnov, white, Naroditsky, black from the Battle Royale in week 7. Back to our main event. What a similarity, right? Um, this position here, I think, is going to be really bad for or white. Um, they're going to have a hard time getting their pieces coordinated ever. So back to the game. Bishop takes c6. When I first saw this move, I thought, can't black basically just win already with just like bishop b7, threatening your bishop, and if you do anything about it, play rook to e8 and trade the queen. And then I thought, well, you know, bishop b7, bishop takes b7, rook e8. I suppose white takes on a8, and I am trading two rooks for the queen, so maybe that's just too much. Maybe that's too silly. But this is a fantastic lesson about development for all of you, which is the lesson on simplification and development leads. Often, if you have a development lead and you can trade a bunch of pieces off the board, if you're not bringing out your opponent's remaining pieces, if you're just trading the pieces that are already out, so... A counterexample would be bishop d2. You're trading a piece that's out, but you're bringing out a new one. So that's not the right kind of trading we're talking about. But if you're trading pieces um, and not bringing out new pieces for them, you actually clarify your development advantage by leaving them with less and less pieces opposed to your pieces that are out and fighting. Um, so you... It's like trading when you're ahead in material, right? When you're ahead in material, they say like, if you've got eight pieces against six, if you trade off like five pieces and now you've got three against one, it's much more obvious that you have this advantage. But the same token when you've got a development lead, if you can trade off a bunch of pieces 
of your opponents that are developed, you can leave it in a situation where you've got two or three fighting pieces and they've got zero. And suddenly it's even more strongly felt what your development lead can do. Um, so I looked into this more and then finally I like popped it into a computer and asked the computer, do you agree with me? I couldn't help myself. And the computer said, I super agree with you. Black's like killing white here. So it's as simple as this. Bishop b7, you're trading off this developed bishop for the bishop on c8. And you're trading off the queen on e2 for the two rooks here and here. So now we go rook e8, bishop a8, queen a8. And if you imagine white going queen e8, queen e8 check, king to d1 or f1, um, you can see that black now has three pieces in the game versus one, right? Let's just flash back and forth to before this operation happened, right? Here, white has bishop, knight, queen, bishop, knight, queen, and black's, you know, it's black's move, and they could maybe bring out the rook, or maybe you don't even want your queen on e2, right? But you know, it's the castling tempo for black. It looks like development's kind of like comparable, right? But now suddenly, I trade my bishop on b7, on c8 long-windedly for years on c6 without bringing out anything new, and I trade my two undeveloped rooks for the queen that was out and covering the white king. And uh, in this position here, suddenly it's three on one. And that means, you know, black can start, you know, aiming to attack things or make or make progress. So anyway, I'm not going to give you 100 variations. I'm going to give you one single variation to show you what this can look like. f3 from white, covering this knight and stopping queen g2. Knight d5 from black. Um, looking at when the queen's traded for the rook and the king goes to d1, having the move knight e3 to harass white. Very hard for white to deal with. So I played c3 for white. Rook e2, king e2, queen e8, check. Um, c3 was blocking off the bishop's pin so this knight could, could get out, um, which it now does. And then I play another trading move, right? And again, this is like perhaps confusing to what you know to play this trading move because you would think like, oh, I don't want to trade off my material, right? My attacking piece for the defending piece. But as long as I don't let these pieces start coming out with tempo, I'm actually going to convert from 3 to 1 to 2 to 0 in a second here. Watch me do it. f5 takes my bishop, takes on e4. Now, if this bishop could come out to a great square, this whole thing would be a failure. But if he goes bishop g5, then, you know, h6 or queen e5. And I think queen e5 is pretty simple and clear, right? That if the bishop saved, then queen b2 check will win the rook and everything. Um, and bishop d2 will probably lose to e3 since um, the other move I'm going to show is like f4 trying to keep this file closed and then black just plays e3 and I'm pretty sure white's just losing here the bishop can't come out queen e4 is coming with either here or here and black's also threatening knight f4 um, since you can't stop queen e4 I think you'll see that white's just going to lose to the power of queen, knight, and pawn yeah now we've got three on zero cheated right that e pawn turned into a piece um, so, you know, the other option for white is to trade off this pawn before it becomes an extra piece. Whoops, that doesn't trade it off. This will trade it off. Check here. And now we've got two on zero. And here you can really see the value of the development, right? We traded every white piece that was out without letting out the other pieces. Now if we can just take away these two squares from this bishop, and g5 he never really has because of queen f5 or h6 or whatever, then white's going to have a tough time here. Swinging the knight to one of these squares to help mate him. Of course, you could also take on b4 and win for black, I think. I try and get this rook into better position. And I grab a pawn, and I grab another pawn. Now I've got two connected pass pawns, and he still doesn't have his stuff together. So, amazing, right? Uh, I mean, it's just, it's not in any way force, but... Um, but I think every other variation, the computer at least said, you know, black's, black's winning. This is, this is what it looks like. So that's how hard you can pay by move 10 for very, very minor failures by white, right? I mean, by this point, bishop takes c6. It's like this bad looking pawn grabbing move. But by this point, I've already said there's nothing good for white in my opinion. So white's last 
chance to not get slaughtered by move 10 by black was to find this move castle sacking the pawn. Once they take on c6, this is just going to be bad. I mean, Feliz didn't play bishop b7, probably afraid that she was trading off too many pieces and there wouldn't be an attack left. But now you guys know that just a queen and a knight can deliver quite a strong attack if there's no opposition. But she plays rook b8, which is also like a perfectly good looking move, right? Developing the rook, and she's got a great idea in mind after white castles, rook b6. Very strong, right? Kicking this bishop that doesn't really want to give up e8, right? And preparing bishop a6. And this move should also kick whites behind. Um, here she had to choose between rook e8 and rook e6. Which move would you play? You can pause this if you want to think about it for a little bit. Rook e8, rook e6, maybe bishop a6, although I've already kind of indicated that's probably not the right move here, but maybe it's the right move. Um, anyway, um, she played rook e6, and then it turns out, I think, that rook e8 is even stronger because it develops another piece, and the rook on b6 is not that bad. Hitting b2 in some variations when you trade... And also the possibility of going rook d6 and trying to like win this piece on d2 <laughs> where it stands. Um, presumably what she was thinking here was, I'm rolling over white, this is crushing, ha ha ha, he took this stupid pawn. And now all I need to do is make sure that I play the right rook move that doesn't allow knight e4 from white developing their pieces. Well, it turns out rook e6 and rook e8 both don't allow knight e4. Um... Not sure I remember why I didn't punch it in, but let's just see if I can find it. Um, knight takes bishop takes bishop b seven f three f five queen c four. Hmm. Hmm, queen d4, bishop takes, pawn takes, queen d4. Not sure, but it doesn't work. <laughs> I checked this earlier and just didn't punch in the variation. I apologize if this shakes your faith in everything. But, um, yeah, this should be, should be indefensible for white. Um, with rook e6, it was more clear, and that may be why she did it, that knight e4, knight e4, bishop e4, f5 wins, because there's no bishop d5 or queen c4 tactic. And that may be why she went for for uh, this variation. Actually, maybe for bishop a6 to stuff the c4 square. But anyway, you're not here for a little tactic lesson. You're here for a strategy lesson. So um, so I think that may be why she chose rook e6 over rook e8 was because the knight e4 calculating the 94 attack to make sure white couldn't get out their pieces, which is the correct and human approach to this kind of position. You just don't want to allow 94 and you assume you're going to roll over white. But I actually like discovered when I looked into this deeper that she's not rolling over white as easily as I thought in this position because although in this position she won in like one more move after b4 bishop f2 check and white could resign, rook f2, rook e1, and king f2, queen d4. Um... If white, instead of playing b4 in this position, played queen c2, it's actually not that easy to prove what black has. And I went through like a lot of long, weird variations trying to, to prove something for black, and it was pretty tough to do. So eventually I had to come back and say, hey, it did matter that she played rook e6 over rook e8. If we play rook e8 instead, queen d1, now we will have an easier time... Um, Proving this for black, um, you know, proving that black has something here. Um, so, you know, now c3 or something, I can go bishop a6, cb4, bishop takes. You see, having not spent a tempo on rook e6 gave me like a couple extra options, and now I have to get this bishop off of knight e4 to really show the power of my rooks. And I'll go g5, h3, h5, and I will eventually get a big advantage here for black. However, white, however, white handles this. Um, maybe g4 trying to stop me. Take, take. Then knight e4 takes here, and I've weakened white's king side before going for for this. Um, these still can't really 
get out so easily. So um, it's super complicated. And that was one of the interesting things I found was like my instinct was similar to Felice's probably, which is like once you get this position here, it's like white's not going to get their pieces out. What are they ever going to do? Black can win without too much effort or calculation. But um, it turned out that there was this sort of like untangling plan here, which is that once queen is here, white wants to play b4, bishop d4, bishop b2. So actually white wasn't so far away from the plan wanting to play b4 in this. It's just, well, b4 in the wrong move order, you know, bishop b d4, you can't even play bishop b2, but also with the queen here, there's bishop f2 check and your queen's on the row with the king. So yeah, so actually, you know, had white played at the very best it's not that easy to win these positions even though it felt like an auto win um, and still requires that precision from black of developing the other piece with rook e8 and not with rook e6 um, obviously a preferable move she must just not have been sure how to beat knight e4 so yeah, I hope all of that shows you some interesting insights into the battle around the development versus the extra pawn. Um, you've got the lesson about how much trouble white gets into with just very, very tiny um, dubious moves of like queen e2 versus, you know, moves like knight d2 or castling or trading pawns. Um, and then how little this extra c6 pawn mattered the lesson of trading off a bunch of material and then still having a winning attack with just a couple pieces if you traded off all whites developed pieces. So the fact that basically black could win a brilliancy prize already at move 10 here with just bishop to b7 and just pfft, knock him out. Um, which for many strong players would just be your, your immediate instinct like it was for me. They would just have seen enough double king pawns and if you guys calibrate like this, you can too. You've seen enough to know that you can just, yeah, trade everything. And in the open position with no white pieces out, your queen by itself will just go and smack everything around. Um, and then finally, the interesting lesson that in this position, that in this kind of position here, um, you know, with like a million pieces out against none, sometimes it's not that easy to finish things off. Sometimes it's still... Sometimes it's still tricky. Sometimes it's still tricky. I went through like pages of analysis, even with the rookie eight variation, which is better in order to find an advantage for black. I had to go through millions of variations to prove it even here. So um, it's actually, it can actually be quite tough to finish things off. So you need to be very, very precise um, in handling these positions um the it feels like it's going to play at it yourself itself positions um they still need you it still needs a brain at the helm so do your best to punish the offending queen mover yes all right i hope that is of great interest to you and uh, i look forward to more um pro chess league action in weeks nine and ten uh see you there